All right. Great. All right. Thanks very much, Phil. And uh, you know, thanks to the other speakers for setting things up really nicely. My, uh, my job in the next 20 minutes is to talk a little bit about reinforcement learning, and in particular, the problem of how machines can learn by doing. Uh, yeah, so let me say what I think I mean by that. So just to take a step back and to think about artificial intelligence more broadly for a moment. Uh, so what's artificial intelligence? Well, to first approximation, artificial intelligence is just a function that maps inputs to outputs. It's the kind of function that maybe you could think of a person doing. So here's a, here's a concrete example. We've got uh, uh, a cool robot. This is a fictional robot. Um, named Baymax, and what Baymax, Baymax is a medical robot, Baymax can do diagnoses of people. Uh, so Baymax can take in information about uh, the person that the, that the standing in front of him, he can measure uh, vital signs and so forth, and then there's some function that maps all that information to a diagnosis, like, you know, you've, you've sustained no injuries, but your hormone levels are really high, the diagnosis is puberty. So the AI program, and this, that's actually from, from the movie. It was a, it's a very, very cool movie. It's nice to see a movie where the robots are the good guys. We don't get a lot of those these days. Um, but uh, the, the, what's going on inside the AI? What is this mapping from input to, to output? And maybe it's some kind of decision tree or something like that, some kind of diagnosis tra chart that it's following. And it raises the question of, well, where did that thing come from? And as Peter said in his talk, well, it could come from programmers who are sitting down and writing down what those rules are. Maybe we've interviewed a whole lot of uh, expert diagnosticians to, to find out what, what good rules are for mapping these inputs to outputs. But, you know, that's hard. So maybe what we can do is, is think of it a little differently. Maybe we can actually think of it as uh, itself a computational problem, that the, the creation of these AI programs itself could be an AI problem, right? A problem that's going to take various kinds of inputs and produce outputs, and the inputs, or the outputs in this case, are going to be the AI program that's going to run on, say, the robot. So, uh, so how do we do that? So the way that we usually think of that, that, that problem of creating the AI system as itself a computational problem is to say, what we're going to do is we're going to define a loss function. We're going to define some kind of function that's going to say how good or bad a given program is. And then what we have to do is search the space of programs with some kind of an optimizer. It's going to consider various different mappings, and it's going to, on the basis of that, propose one that seems to score well, that has, uh, has low loss or high value. All right, well, so, so you know, we've, now we've solved the problem uh, by turning it into another problem that we now need to solve. All right, so how do we do that? How do we actually define this loss function so that it captures the things about the problem that we really care about? And so to a first approximation, what machine learning is, is the problem of defining that loss function by using lots of data. All right, so data might have the form of, okay, here's a bunch of uh, sensor readings from, for a bunch of different people and what the correct diagnosis is. Maybe we've actually captured real diagnosticians going off and, and writing down what the diagnosis should be in each of these cases. We've collected lots and lots and lots and lots of examples of those. And now we say, okay, let's search for an AI program that does the kinds of things that the real people did, that, that would produce the same answers, or the same, roughly the same answers as what people do. And in fact, usually that's not quite enough. We can, we can get various kinds of overfitting if we do that the wrong way. So usually we combine both how well does the new system that we're proposing do on the data that we've captured in the past, plus we don't want it to be too complicated. Right? So, so there's usually a term that says, well, we want it to be a relatively simple mapping, and we want it to be a mapping that actually does well on the data. And so with this kind of setup, you can actually learn all sorts of things. And as, as Rob talked about in his talk, uh, image recognition and speech recognition are actually doing incredibly well by building on exactly this kind of paradigm. Now, the reinforcement learning problem is a little bit different. So the reinforcement learning problem says that really what we want to do is develop some kind of a behavior, some kind of sequential behavior, <laughs> where the system is interacting with the world and doing good things you know, more often than it does bad things. So the loss function becomes, well, maximize total reward. Maximize some kind of function of, of behavior so that, so that good things are, are more apt to occur. So the, the data that we get in that case might have a slightly different form. It might be various kinds of, well, you know, the, the diagnostician robot approaches the person and asks some questions, and then the person gives some answers, and then the diagnostician program hits the person with a hammer, and then the person like, cries out in pain, and then the diagnostician robot makes some kind of you know, diagnosis, and then the overall score of this was like negative four. Like, it was probably not good to make the person scream in pain. 
So, so we have ways of now scoring the, the transitions. Instead of saying, okay, you should mimic this, we give, uh, like the patent example that Peter gave, we give the, the, the system an opportunity to surprise us <laughs> and, um, and sort of see how all that works out. All right, so that's the reinforcement learning program, uh, reinforcement learning problem in a nutshell. But, uh, you know, in case you're not sure whether this is a hard thing or, a, or an easy thing, let's maybe we should try one. So, so Bill, do, is Bill still here? Yeah, do you have your mic still? Can, can I get you to talk? Okay, all right. So what I'd like you to do is, is do this reinforcement learning problem. So you don't have to, yeah, okay, you just need the microphone. This is unrehearsed. This is unrehearsed. <laughs> Nobody knew this was going to happen. It's all about spontaneity. All right, so here we go. Okay, so here's, what, here's what's going to happen. So you get to, you get to see this. Yeah. All right, it's kind of like a little video game. Oh yeah, you can see okay. it over there as well. Yeah. Um, and you get, to just, you get to choose actions, and your actions are the standard kind of actions that you might have in a video game, like up, down, left, right, and then you've got two buttons you can push, A and B. All right, and I'll tell you if you win. Ready, go. Go right. Go up. Wait, wait, hang on, I'll tell you, let, me, let me try to go right. It's not, I'm not very effective here. All right, you said go right, it, that happened, okay. Uh, down three. Down three, boink, boink. Boink. Over uh, right one. Right one. Up four. Over uh, right one. Down two. <laughs> Over right one. Down three. Left one. Did I win? No, I would tell you. You would tell me. I promise. I give up. Really? <laughs> Does anybody have any suggestions for him? Green box. Up four, right one. <laughs> Usually I Up do. Two. Good idea. I don't know how to tell if I'm winning. Yeah, it's, it's a tough We're, life I in thought, reinforcement I, I learning. I thought land. I was supposed to get reinforced. So. Yes, so far there's been the, all the reinforcement learning is telling you that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. All right, anyway. <laughs> so, in, in this case, if you, if you actually go over to the, to the green circle and then you do the A button, oops, uh, yeah, you do the A button and then you move around, you discover that you've actually, now the green thing is with you and if you actually bring that over to the green square and put it down, then you win. Usually I do this example with where everybody calls out things and there's usually somebody who calls out the right thing so it actually goes pretty fast. Um, <laughs> So I, I apologize, Bill. <laughs> that, was, that was really, that was kind of mean. But, but, my point was, my point was that it's kind of hard. Okay, so, so uh, you know, you get to move around. I'll tell you when you win. You have this board position. The data in a reinforcement learning problem is, is weird and complicated, especially compared to what we were seeing in, in the supervised learning case, where it's like, you know, when you hear, you know, when, when you see this thing, you should say it's a slug and not a cucumber. This is saying, okay, now the world looks like this. There's a screen, you did a joystick action, you got no reward, I'm really sorry. Then you saw a new screen and you did a joystick action and you got another non-reward, sorry. But anyway, eventually something happened and you got a reward, hooray. All right, so now your data looks like this and the little moments of of interaction are actually these little, little quadruples. We were in some state, we took some action, we got some reward and we got to observe what the, the resulting state was. You see is more and more and, and more of those uh, that are now kind of giving us various kinds of feedback. So how do we actually use this sort of feedback to behave better in the environment? So the main idea is that there's actually a couple different kinds of functions that you could learn that could be helpful for this problem. One kind of function that ultimately the function that we want is the policy function that says when you see this, this is the right thing to do to maximize reward. It would be great if you could just know that off the bat, but you don't. There's other kinds of functions, though, that can maybe help get us there. So one kind of function, another kind of function is the value network. The value network says, if you're in this situation and you do this thing, here's how that's going to work out for you numerically in the long run. Okay? So it gives you a measure, it returns a measure of, you know, how are things going? So the Ed Koch sort of, sort of idea, like, how am I doing? All right, negative three. Okay, that's not so good. I should try something else. All right, so you can use this kind of information to actually decide what to do because you can now do little what if experiments in your head. I'm in this situation, what if I were to go up here? Oh, my value network says that's not so good. What if I go down here? Oh, my value network says that's great, let me try that. All right, um, and then a third kind of network that, or, or function that it would be nice to learn is uh, a model network that says, 
uh, let me just predict, let me just understand how the world works. If I'm in this situation and I do this joystick command, here's, what, here's where I'll end up. I'll end up in a new situation, it looks like this, and I will have gotten no reward, at least immediately, but maybe that new position is something that better sets me up for positive reward in the future. So how do we use this, this notion of, well, we've got this data and we've got these various functions that we, that we could learn, how do we actually now use this to develop better versions of those functions? So uh, one nice way to do this is with apprenticeship learning. Apprenticeship learning says, well, you know, I, we're going to teach Bill how to do this by actually putting him on the spot, and, or not putting him on the spot, but like, I'll show him how to do it. He'll look to see what I did and then mimic me, all right? So find me, uh, the loss function here is match the expert play. We have data showing how you're supposed to act. We'll just copy that. That's not always available. So uh, another kind of loss function that you could use to train these networks is uh, the actual value for playing. So I've got a rule, I'm gonna try it in the environment over and over and over again, see how well it does, and then over time search for better and better mappings, better and better policies that make my loss for playing lower, my reward higher. I could also uh, learn this, this, this value prediction network, and I can do that with a kind of bootstrapping. I can use what's known as temporal difference learning to say, all right, well, I was in some state, I chose some action, I got to some next state, what's my prediction for the, re you know, for the rest of time from there? My prediction from where I started should be a little bit like that. So I'll move my prediction closer to uh, what I saw when I moved one step further along into the sequence. And in the model-based idea, I can actually use my experience to make predictions of what's going to happen next, and then use that prediction to actually plan ahead, right? So if I know how the world works, or at least I have a cartoon version of it in my head, I can say, well, this is a good thing to do, because it'll lead to this, which will lead to this, which will lead to this, which will get me reward. So these, there's a bunch of different things now that we can use to kind of um, uh, get that kind of feedback so that we can improve our behavior. And so back in 2008, I, uh, some students and I kind of applied this idea to Atari video games, because that what I did a lot of as a child, and I feel like somebody should just solve this so that I don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, and so we connected a, uh, a learning machine to the, the, the screen of the, of the video game. Now the input is the screen of the video game, the output is the joystick command, and the reward in this case is you know, making or the points in, in the game. And um, we did okay with this, but we did a tremendous amount of hand tuning. We created little recognizers for the, this is, he's known as Pitfall Harry, the little guy in the video game. We made little recognizers for the ladder and so forth. We didn't say what these things did, but we had to pull them out of the image. And perception is a kind of a hard problem. But nowadays, we have these, these deep networks, these, these, this idea of deep learning, which actually solves the perception problem, or at least addresses it very effectively. So what we've been doing, what, what the field has been doing, is saying, okay, well, what if we didn't have to worry about the perceptual part anymore? What if we just make that part of the whole the learning process. And so uh, my colleagues at, at DeepMind in London uh, came up with an architecture they called DQN, the DeepQ network, which is specifically trying to take screens from the video game and map them to, to uh, value prediction. How well will I do in the video game from this board if I choose this action or this action or this action? They train this with millions and millions of games uh, of, of you know, getting to interact with the video game and, uh, and, and create really good players for these games. So this is the results that were published in, in Nature a couple years ago, uh, 2015, where they, were, they, they took 40, same network architecture, same learning system, different video games. It plugged them into different video games and let them play. And what was, what was really amazing and surprising is that for each of these games, it, it actually played quite well. The, the, uh, of the 50 games that they tried, there's a little dividing line there for like what a, a good human player might be at. And most of the games, the, the, uh, the machine did better than than a human player in these games. Uh, Pong, it did really, really well. But there's a whole variety of games, and it's, again, it's the same network architecture, the same setup, the same learning procedure for each of these, and it learns very different strategies in very different kinds of games. Some are kind of more 3D, some are very 2D, some are actually 2D but kind of look 3D. Anyway, the point is that, that it can handle lots of different kinds of games, and it's using these, exactly these sorts of ideas. Uh, the, uh, some of the people on that team at the same company went on and attacked Go, and this has come up in a couple of the talks so far because it really is a surprising result in, in AI. It says, we're going to take a game that's been around for a thousand years uh, that people have been, pr people are pretty good at, but computers have been really bad at. Like when, uh, when Deep Blue was beating human champions in chess, uh, the best Go playing programs at the time were losing to teenagers. <laughs> like it, you didn't have to play Go very well to beat the best programs. 
So uh, what the, the team at DeepMind discovered is that if you can, if you think of the Go board as being kind of like an image, that part of what's going on in Go is a perceptual problem. You have to you know, see the board and see the relationships in the board and then use that to inform your sense of whether you're in a good position or a bad position. And so they, uh, they hooked up a deep network to, uh, to various kinds of reinforcement learning modules and made a really strong Go playing program that went five uh, five wins, zero losses to the European champion in October 2015. It then uh, played against one of the, a former human champion, world champion, and won four games to one, and is continuing to play games online and just trashing everybody, just everybody who comes and plays this game. Now, the sad part is, you know, we can feel sad because we're people and we're losing, uh, but we can also feel really happy because what, if you actually analyze the games, people are looking at these really closely and like, ha, huh, I did not know that that's how Go worked. Now I'm a better Go player, and people are actually becoming better at the game as a result of looking to see what these algorithms are doing in similar situations. The actual architecture for, for AlphaGo is, uh, is pretty sophisticated. So one of the things that the, the DeepMind people have at their disposal is lots and lots and lots of computers, but they're also very um, uh, not shy about just creating all sorts of new architectures and gluing them together in crazy ways. So, so in, in the original AlphaGo setup, they, the first thing they did is they said, okay, well, we've got, people play Go online. We can collect lots of data on this. We can actually do it as an apprenticeship learning problem. We can say, well, here's a board, here's a, a Go board. Here's what a human did in that Go board. Here's another Go board. Here's what a human did in that Go board. 30 million expert games of Go, you start to get, you know, kind of a good idea of what's a reasonable move in lots of situations. So they trained up a policy network to actually imitate that, to take the state of the Go board and produce, produce an action. But they weren't done then, right? At that point, you're not going to really do better than people if you do that or at least not much better than people. You can't really surprise you. But what you can do is use that information as a way of bootstrapping a policy network that's going to be trained to actually win at Go. So, um, so instead of just copying people, what it does is it takes that original network and says, OK, this is now a good play Go player. Let's take as our loss function beating that Go player. And so they tune the weights of their, of their new network to actually do well against the old network. And then they iterate that time and time and time again. They're getting better and better and better Go playing networks out of that. They, and they're not done there. They actually use that then it, uh, to predict value. So given the way that these networks now play, we can, we can now build up our own big data set of uh, here's a Go board. Here's, how, here's whether or not our Go player won or lost given that Go board. Here's another one. Here's whether it won or lost. We have this big data collection of uh, board states, Go board states, and whether they ended up in wins or losses. You can train out that network, and now you've got a whole bunch of things. You have a, a pretty good network for predicting next moves. You have a pretty good network for deciding whether a Go board is good or not. And you can actually start to use that for search. You can actually say, in a way that's not so different from how the chess programs work, here's a board. Let's, in our heads, imagine a whole bunch of steps forward in the game and see how they turn out where the game is being played by the, uh, the best network that we currently have, and the value of states is being predicted by the best value network we have. But we're not completely taking it seriously. We're actually imagining a whole bunch of games playing that way to see how they turn out. And ultimately, after doing lots and lots of those games, we now say, OK, I think this stone in this position would be a good place to move right now. Then, the, 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 then you know, Lisa Dahl goes, whatever, the human player goes, and now it's back to the computer to decide what the next move should be, and it goes through this process all again. It's a lot of computation, and it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable how all these pieces fit together, but it plays state-of-the-art Go. Uh, there are some, uh, I guess I don't have a ton of time left, but there are some really interesting results happening. A lot, of, a lot of what's been successful, and I think this is a theme that's coming up in a lot of these talks, there's lots of cool problems that we can solve now, but it's by no means a done deal. One of the things that, we, that, that is, is in common with both of these examples is that you can have a system play Atari video games for a week all by itself without any people having to intervene. You can have it play Go games, basically 80 years of, effectively 80 years of Go playing. Uh, you can just have the computers do that. When you're talking about interacting with the physical world, it gets trickier, it gets harder, because you don't have a, a high-speed simulator that you can use to, to uh, learn on to see how, 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 how you're doing at any given point. And so for robotic stuff, it can be, it can be much more difficult. Um, and in fact, most of the robotic stuff is still with, with simulators. Um, oops. But it's still kind of cool to see these. And they do look sort of vaguely, 
like natural. So now the problem is we've got a, a, a control network that's deciding based on the, the positions of all the joints in the robot, decides how to exert forces on all the joints, and then its, its score is being measured by how far it moves when it's hopping or how far it moves when it's walking. And I like this one in particular because it sort of looks like it's, you know, kind of, <laughs> it's a little bit unnatural, but then again, you know, you're not just a stick. So, you know, that's maybe why you walk a little differently than that. Um, the process by which it learns to do this is an iterative process. A network is proposed, it gets evaluated, that information is then used to try to improve the network, and it doesn't start off all that great, you know. Um, but eventually, it, uh, it's able to find a controller that actually is very effective with respect to this loss function. The uh, physical stuff is lagging behind a little bit, but there's cool things happening. So this is a... <laughs> This is a PR2 robot that's, that's responsible for solving the extremely important problem of getting the red Lego to fit on top of the blue Lego. <laughs> and some of the, th I mean, there's a lot that's amazing in this work. One of the things that's very cool is, of course, you know, it's actually doing the learning and doing the controlling, but the loss function is a really key element of this. So they have cameras set up not to decide what to do, but to decide whether or not the Lego has successfully made it on top of the other Lego. If you don't have that signal, you can't learn, right? You have, you have no ability to measure how your performance is. And so, um, so that ends up, you know, when you build these systems, you have to build the controller, but you also have to be, build the observer, the, the, cri the critic, essentially, that's deciding whether or not you're doing a good job. And that's this, this same kind of setup has actually been used for a whole bunch of problems. Again, you know, these are toddler problems, in a sense. We're going backwards, uh, screwing, the, screwing the cap on a water bottle, pulling a little wooden nail out of a, out of a, a wooden nail bench, um, putting, <laughs> putting a square peg in a square hole. Um, <laughs> hanging a hanger on the, on the pole because the robot never cleans up after itself. All right, so, um, so, so these are the sorts of problems that you can define, and in each case you have to define a thing that says, have I succeeded or not, and then, then you can actually search. The network that's being used for all this stuff is, again, another deep, archi deep architecture that's going from the RGB, the visual signal coming to the system, through a series of layers to um, actually actuating the individual joints on the robot. All right, so that was, that's you know, my introduction to you guys on uh, reinforcement learning, how it works, what we're doing these days. Um, let's see, so uh, yeah, reinforcement learning is machine learning, but it's specifically about optimizing behavior, and this, the revolution in deep networks, as, as Bill said in the very, very beginning, we're in this really exciting time now, where it's a little you know, kid in a candy store version where we're saying, okay, well, these, this technology exists, we're gonna try it apply it to this, apply it to this, apply it to this, let's see what happens, let's see if we can understand this and start to generalize to say, okay, here's how we can solve the, the hard AI problems that really are gonna have impacts on society. Thanks very much. We do have time for a couple of questions. Start there. Yeah. The impression that one gets from this is that the models are extremely adept at learning. Obviously, they achieve levels of performance just about as good as the most expert humans, but the amount of experience required by the models to achieve that level of performance appears to be many of orders of magnitude greater than what a person does. So then the question becomes, what is it a person's doing to get so good that the machines are not able to implement, which if they would, they could get as good as a person a lot faster than they already do. Yes, this is, this is one of several really important open problems right now. So I'm engaging with some uh, cognitive scientists at, at MIT who, are, who have asked that specific problem. They, they, they like the Atari games in particular, and they, they've collected data on people who are unfamiliar with Atari games, because people like that exist. Um, and, and have them learn to play a new game, and they learn, they, they start off bad and they get better, but they learn in the, in, the, in, the, in the span of like four or five games, not four or five hundred thousand games. And so it's, it's absolutely clear that the process is a different process. It's not a simple, we're gonna update the weights a little bit and then try everything again. There's a lot more insight, there's a lot more uh, high level representation that's being brought to bear. And I think, we, you know, we don't know at this point, but it could have a, a significant impact on the ability of these systems to adapt to more natural environments. So uh, I thought when we had our unrehearsed human example from our colleague, which was wonderful, uh, you know, it's clear that a human will give up. And... Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I'm assuming that it takes 
a bit longer for a computer to give up, but does it, uh, <laughs> do you start out with something easy where the opportunities for success are, are uh, more apparent and then does that, is that faster to start easy and go hard or is it? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. So, so to what extent uh, do we make use of kind of curricular design? Like when we're trying to teach people to learn to do calculus, we don't start them off with a book and we're like, we're going to give you food at the end of the day if you can do problem seven, right? That's, it's, it's a very weak and, and difficult way of actually doing the learning. Instead, we kind of build up skills and then we re have people do exercises where they recombine the skills in various ways. We're just starting to think about how to train networks in that, in that form. There is, there is various work, and it came up uh, in one of the previous talks in terms of transfer learning, this idea that maybe we can train it on an easier task, and then what you've learned in that easier task could actually be applicable to the new task. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is video games themselves, video game design itself is actually really interesting in that usually video game designers are attuned to this, and they'll design video games specifically so that they kind of build your skills up over time. And, um, so I find that really interesting. The th sorts of things that they put into the video game so that you can master the video game later, they don't start you at the last level. They start you at simpler levels. And I think that's partly for us is to get the motivation up, but also to build up the, uh, the knowledge base that's necessary. OK, let's, let's thank Michael again. Thanks for coming.